Hello, and welcome to the JCC of Metro Detroit, 69th Annual Detroit Jewish Book Fair. My name is Nina Chudnoff, and I'm a member of the Book Fair Committee. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this Tuesday afternoon with the book, Life Isn't Everything, Mike Nichols as Remembered by 150 of His Closest Friends, compiled by Ash Carter and Sam Kashner. The goal of the Detroit Jewish Book Fair is to bring the best new Jewish books and authors from around the world to Metro Detroit. This year, the rooms may all be, that we're sitting in may be different, but the purpose is the same. The Jewish Book Fair runs until tomorrow, December 9th, and we'll have an exceptional lineup of planned events for you. To see our full event schedule, learn about ways to support Book Fair, and watch events that you might have missed. And find you can find them on, and find our online store where you can find Life Isn't Everything and plenty of other hands-on, selected, hand-selected books and gifts. Visit our bookstore at culturalarts.jccdet.org slash bookfair. This year, in order to provide as much programming to the community as possible, We've made all our events free of charge. So if you enjoy this event and other book fair events, please consider becoming a patron or donating to book fair. You can do either or both on our website, culturalarts.jccdet.org slash book fair. We rely on community support to make this annual event possible. So thank you in advance for becoming a part of our family. The Book Flare team would like to thank Barbara Nussbaum for being our event co-sponsor today. We have a really special program for you and we want you to be a part of it. You can ask questions and offer comments in the YouTube comments section below or by texting the number on the corner of your screen. Our speakers have a great discussion prepared and they will take as many of your questions as they can. While you're here at our YouTube channel, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click on the reminder bell. That way you'll never miss any of our exciting events. The focus of today's event is Life Isn't Everything. Mike Nichols is remembered by 150 of his closest friends. We have with us the authors of the book, Ash Carter and Sam Kashner, as well as Elliot Wilhelm, who will moderate our discussion. The work of Mike Nichols pervades American cultural consciousness, from the graduate and who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, to Angels in America, The Birdcage, Working Girls, and Primary Colors, he was also one half of the timelessly funny duo, Nichols and May. In Life is Everything, for the first time, Ash Carter and Sam Kashner offer an intimate look behind the scenes of Nichols' life. As told by stars and moguls, playwrights, producers, comics, and crew members who stayed loyal to Nichols for many, many years. Ash Carter is a writer and editor whose work has appeared in Esquire, Vanity Fair, Town and Country, and the New York Times. Sam Kashner is the editor at large at Air, Air Mail and was for many years a contributing editor to Vanity Fair magazine. Elliot Wilhelm is the Detroit Institute of Arts, director of the Detroit Film Theater and part-time faculty member for Wayne State University. Please join me in welcoming Ash Carter, Sam Kashner, and Elliot Wilhelm. Hello guys, Hello. welcome. Hi. This is uh, great fun for me. First of all, I wanna congratulate you on what you've achieved here. Um, it's, it's clearly not a, a conventional biography, but it's better in, in so many ways because you don't have to wait uh, to get the the quotes from people who were there and who who knew somebody who is of of great great 
interest. I have to talk about myself for one second, and then I promise I will, I will try to keep it to a minimum, but it's one of my terrible habits. Um, I've been doing my job at the DIA, which is programming film, uh, which has involved doing a lot of travel to film festivals and so on over uh, 46 years now. And I have met a lot of people and been in the room with a lot of people and overheard a lot of things. And periodically, if somebody uh, famous comes up, I'll say, oh, I once met so-and-so and here's what I heard that person say, or I had an exchange with somebody. And people will say to me, well, why don't you write all these stories down? Because they're so interesting. They're really not stories. They're little bits and pieces of things I've overheard. But what you've done is to take a large number of people who have all encountered uh, some closely, some not as closely, and focus them on a single individual. It's kind of like a, a super citizen cane experience in which you're getting this, this point of view and you manage to do it in a chronological way that I found completely engaging. What also helps is that Nichols uh, is a fantastic person to, to read about uh, and to discover um, as somebody who's admired him forever. I think my first encounter, my dad was a, was a doctor and when I was, I don't know, eight or nine years old, he brought home this record. Uh, it was Nichols and May do Doctors. And it was played in my house incessantly. It was constantly there, had it all memorized. And I want to know who these people were. Uh, and I began to discover it. How did you uh, become fascinated uh, by Mike Nichols? And anybody, either of you, just let me know. Sam, do you want to start? Sam's frozen. Okay. Well, Either that or I've impressed him so much that he, he simply cannot change his mood. So Ash, maybe you can. My um, uh, my dad was also a fan of Nichols and May and would play the, you know, the CD version on in car trips and things like that. And you know, I'd certainly seen a handful of his movies. Um, you know, definitely *The Graduate* multiple times, *Birdcage*. Uh, you know, *Working Girl*. Like so, some of the, 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 you know, more uh, commercial movies, I guess. Um, but then, I but I didn't really have a, such a great interest in him as a figure. He just, you know, as a young kind of uh, budding film snob, I was more attracted to. Uh, you know, there were certain directors that just seemed to kind of cut a, a more distinct, distinctive profile, and and somebody my age like didn't really have such a great sense of Nichols as a man. But then um, after I graduated film school, I went and tried to get a job on a movie, and wound up uh, as a PA, the fifth of five PAs on Charlie Wilson's War, which was Mike Nichols' last movie. And you know it is a pretty big production, so I'm not going to say that I was uh, at close hand all the time. But you know, one would walk by him, and you know he would make a wise crack, or you would hear things from other crew members, and just that exposure really, um, I was just really you know taken by him, uh, seduced to use a word that comes up a lot in the book, and then I found out. Subsequently, so one of my fellow PAs went on to work at Mike's production company called Icarus, which you know ties into the story of the book. Um, uh, the and and he got me into a couple of uh, Mike's acting classes, which you know again I never knew. A lot of people don't know that he taught acting at a school that he co-founded in Manhattan, and uh, just he hearing him. Uh, talk to these actors, like that was sort of what really sealed it for me. And uh, and then, you know, I, Sam and I fell into conversation after he had done the third of, well, I mean, maybe Sam, you can explain your, your uh, personal history. Oh, well, um, yeah, well, we met a few times uh, because I, I did a few Vanity Fair pieces that involved Mike. Uh, one with uh, Julia Roberts, uh, um, it's like a conversation between the two of them, and I was just kind of the linesman in, in this thing. 
In fact, I was the linesman in most all of them, really. I mean, I didn't have to do very much. And the other was uh, a kind of reunion in print of, uh, of Mike with Elaine May. And, uh, and then uh, I did a piece about the making of The Graduate, um, uh, which is, a, 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 I think, kind of a lively chapter in our book among many lively chapters. And, um, uh, and uh, so that's, that's how we met initially. And, and uh, um, so. And, you know, basically, I'm sorry, go ahead. after the, the reunion interview came out, um, Sam and I got to talking about our shared enthusiasm. And then after Mike died, he suggested we kind of get some of his friends on the phone uh, and record their reminiscences. And that became a Vanity Fair piece, which, you know, we, we had, it was an 11,000 word story. And it's just, there was so much left to say that we decided that there's, that we think there's a book here. Yeah, it, it works really well. And I would like to actually sort of begin talking about yeah. The Graduate a little yeah. bit. I don't know if we need to, to uh, keep everything completely um, uh, linear because we don't have that much time, but um, The Graduate always feels like it just was this, this unified, magnificent piece of storytelling that had its finger on the, the um, pulse of people of my generation at the moment it came out and was completely conceived and executed uh, without any bumps. It just had this, this coherence to it that touched a generation of people. But it wasn't, like most movies, um, it, it wasn't that simple, right? It came uh, up in, in, a, in a way that involved a lot of different hands and a lot of changes. Could you talk a little bit about the, the genesis of The Graduate and what it was like for, for Mike Nichols to, to go through that experience? Sam, you want to get started? Well, you know, at f it, it went through several iterations. I mean, just the, the, the screenplay alone before it got to, um, to, Buck, to Buck Henry. Uh, Calder Willingham was, was a, a novelist who took a crack at it. And, um, uh, and um, so, so uh, it was challenging. I mean, you know, he didn't, he he really didn't uh, know that much, you know. I mean, and um, uh, and he was kind of the incredible thing was learning on the job, and and perhaps the most the, the thing about the graduate I think that had the longest lasting effect was the casting uh, of Dust, of Dustin Hoffman. Um, you know, Buck Henry told us, uh, you know, that he went to a screening, uh, kind of a, a, a friends of the film screening early on, and people loved it, but they said, you know, there's something <laughs> too bad weird. about, <laughs> there's something really weird about that kid, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, and and you know, it's not as if uh, he didn't offer the uh, Benjamin character to, to other actors. I mean, there's a famous story about um, his, his, uh, First, offering the part of Benjamin to uh, Robert Redford, and well, um, uh, he's described in the book as looking like Robert Redford. Isn't yeah. He? It, well, yeah, it's funny. He's not really just he's not really described in the book, but it's very much implied that that he is. It, and and you know when you especially when you think about the fact that this you know very attractive older woman next door is kind of throwing herself at him. It is you know one does lead, jump to that conclusion a little bit. And um, so, yeah, Redford did test for the part. Uh, he did a test with Candy Bergen and a whole bunch of actors, um, Charles Grodin and uh, Tony Bill. And so basically they, and Mike just wasn't happy with any of the tests. And um, they had seen, because uh, Dustin Hoffman was not, a, you know, he was nothing at the time. He just kind of gotten his first break off off Broadway in a play called Eh, and it got a good notice in the uh, uh, Sunday Times, and he had had a very brief uh, appearance in, in um, a movie uh, called Tiger Makes Out, I think. And so anyway, they they brought him in, and Hoffman didn't even he he tested, but then when Nichols offered him the uh, when he wanted to 
to have him try like really, you know, audition, Hoffman said no, because he said, you know, look, you, I'm not this guy, like I'm a, I'm a character actor, but you know, a five foot 10 goy, like that's my limit. And we, you want a guy like Robert Redford basically. And Nichols said, it's because you're Jewish, isn't it? And Hoffman said, yeah. And Nichols said, well, maybe Benjamin's Jewish inside. And then he agreed to test. Uh, and, it, and it was a kind of a disastrous, uh, from from his point, from Hoffman's point of view, not a good test, right? I mean, um, uh, you know, some subway coins. In fact, it, it, he felt it had gone so badly, and so did the the skeleton crew that was that was doing the test. Some of his uh, subway co uh, subway tokens fell out of his pocket. And one of the members of the crew picked it up and said, you know, here, kid, you're going to need these. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I want to dwell for a second on the, that. Um, I, I think it's significant. So he, he did, so he changed the, he cast a Jewish actor in the role, but he never, he doesn't, he didn't change the, 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 the character itself. He never made him explicitly Jewish. And there's, you know, no uh, overt suggestion that he is. Um, and I, I think it's, it, it was an interesting choice. And, and when you think about the way that he talked Hoffman into doing it, I think that it's, you know, it's happening at the same time as like Philip Roth is writing Portnoy's Complaint and so forth. And, and um, but by, by just casting the Jewish actor in the part of a non explicitly Jewish character, he is sort of saying that, I mean, he's dragging the mainstream towards Jewishness. He's, he's addressing the film to the sort of inner Jew in, in every American. And that's, you know, why the, and, and, you know, why the film did strike such a, a chord in, I mean, it was the, you know, such a phenomenal success. I think that that has, that has a lot to do with it. And, oh. and there's an element in there also in terms of, of being a misfit um, that I think is almost amplified by the fact that he, when you look at his mom and dad and how they live and how they act and, and so much of, of what's around them, uh, Benjamin almost seems like Fredo in, the, in that sense. It's like, uh, I sort of don't belong here. Everything that I'm seeing, I'm, and a lot of us felt that way about our parents at the time and about society around us, uh, that whole yeah. welcoming home party. But it works to his advantage in terms well, of carving out that part. As, as Hoffman told us, uh, he briefly, his, his, his own father had was sort of, you know, up and down all the time, like successful, not successful. And there was a brief period where he lived in Beverly Hills and he said he never felt more of an outsider in his life. And in fact, a friend, of, a, a schoolmate friend of his lived in the, the real house that was used as the exterior for the Robinsons, I'm pretty sure it was the, was the one, but. So, yeah. I, I, what was I, what was the? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sam. Well, no, I, I was actually. I thought this was very funny and in tribute to Buck Henry, who was really helpful to us and and who we lost uh, to the greater universe. Um, you know, uh, not not long after our, our book came out, actually. Buck, I'll, I'll read this. Buck said. Um, about the graduate, um, we decided to switch it and make Nouveau Riche Beverly Hills Jews out of them. It's my theory of California genetics. Jews from New York came, and within one generation, the Malibu sand had gotten into their genes and turned their children into tall Nordic powerhouses. <laughs> uh, Buck Henry was a brilliant, brilliant man. Some people uh, may not know, but of course, he played the room clerk. Um, in a in a small but very pivotal role um, in the graduate, and was just an arch, brilliant, brilliant writer who actually, as I understand it, did really write the complete finished screenplay of the graduate, but shared screen credit because it went to another writer originally, right? Exactly. It was just a, an arbitration. I mean, a, a, a screenwriters guild thing, and they just. You know, even though they, they threw out Calder Willingham's entire script and, and used bucks, but that's just how it got arbitrated. And yeah, I mean, I just, I, if I could say one more thing about the, what you're, what you commented upon as a, the, the movie just, you know, speaking to a generation, um, I think that that's definitely, that uh, is, you know, re was reflected in its 
uh, huge success when the movie came out. I think though that when you compare it to other certain other um, kind of youth movies or books um, from the time, or even you know for things that spoke to subsequent gen generations, The Graduate is you know it's like most people discover it when they're um, kind of of Benjamin's age, but the movie you know as you get older and watch it uh, you know again and again you start to notice like you you find yourself maybe empathizing with different characters you know there's just an ambivalence it's not just kind of like a the message of the movie is not just oh you know like don't trust anyone over 30 i mean right. there, there's a just a, there's a deep ambivalence um uh that and and just a it's a very complex movie and a, a, you know one that rewards repeat viewings over time it's not just something that um you know you kind of read when or watch when you're young and then you know it, it's it's a sort of a young man's thing it's not like that i think and and i think um as you point out i don't know of any great work of art whether it's literature uh, uh painting or, or in my case movies in particular that don't age with you that don't change um, as they as they age, that you see completely differently. I'm sure Mike Nichols would would totally agree. Looking at a film that either he made or was moved by, um, I mean, I, I I remember seeing Citizen Kane when I was very young, either single digits or just just beyond. And mm -hmm. now at 70, I can look at Citizen Kane and start to identify with the old man who <laughs> was not the nicest person in the world necessarily, but did certain things for, for certain reasons. And those are the things that stay. Those are the things that, that last. And Nichols always seemed to want to add that extra, that extra layer of, I wouldn't say durability, but of, of having lasting value at, at whatever age. He didn't pander. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's complexity, you know, is, is what accounts for it in his case, yeah. Also, would either of you like to talk? Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. Go ahead. Well, I was we, we should pay tribute to the ingenious use of the Simon and Garfunkel music, which certainly endeared it to to that generation, and it's still kind of a terrific use of that music, which you know Mike only really knew about thanks to his brother, the Doctor Robert Nichols. You know, who said you should really listen. You should check this out. You know, and uh, uh, I, I think that, I mean, it's a great work, but it's, it's you know, I think that it's really important to people in, at least. Yeah, very it much. Kind and of and ingenious I would, use of that music, I think. I would add that, that in addition to the, the oh, perfection of the Simon and Garfunkel lyrics and music in The Graduate, um, Nichols' use of it also changed uh, movie soundtracks forever. Okay because hearing what were essentially complete songs over long sequences of a film. I mean, before that, you, you could look at things like, uh, let's say Vertigo, and, and there would be long passages of music that were specifically mm -hmm. written for the film. But to, to have complete songs that people, popular music that was identified with emotionally in a certain way, it was a breakthrough. Yeah, and um, it's, it was, you know, I mean, this was in uh, Blue Hawaii or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't musical in a sense, yeah. but in another way, it was a very sophisticated uh, musical in its way. Yeah, I mean, um, he, actually, he actually hired them to write original yeah, songs, and they, they, they took so long doing it, and so he used the, the songs from their album, Sounds of Silence, as temp tracks, and then he got so attached to them that he just, he never, the, the only new song that they did use is Mrs. Robinson, which was originally titled Mrs. Roosevelt, but... Um, would either of you like to talk a little yeah. bit about the early years? Um, what what um, Mike Nichols' childhood was like? How he got here? How he got into the uh, position of being um, a, a New York show business personality, and then being listed in every um, biography that I've looked up quickly on the web about Mike Nichols as film director. Uh, it, it was a, a kind of a long journey, I think, for him to be. Uh, listed first and foremost as a film director, um, something that also happened to Woody Allen, but uh, you know, in, in you know, Mike Woody Nichols' case, specifically interesting. Woody Allen wanted to write 
for Nichols in May. In fact, he, he sort of, in, in an inadvertent way, he became a stand-up, Woody Allen became a stand-up comic, I, I believe, because, um, you know, uh, the, the Nichols in May, their manager said, well, you know, they do their own material, you know, they don't, they don't use writers. And uh, I think it was Jack Ross who was, was one of their managers who said to Woody Allen, but you know, you should really try stand up on your own. And uh, I believe it was Woody Allen who told Ash that, um, you know, in, in some way he, uh, he owed his stand up career and all that followed to not being able to write for Nichols in May, you know? Yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, briefly, he, he was born um, Igor M Mikhail Peshkowski in Berlin, and his parents fled the, you know, what was uh, kind of increasingly um, uh, oppressive um, kind of treatment of Jews in Germany at the time. You know, we all know what happened next. Basically, his, his father, they, they, they came over, you know, um, he came over with his brother by himself because his father had come over previously to set up a medical practice um, in New York. And so it was just the two of them on the boat by themselves. Uh, you know, he arrives in America speaking no English. His, he has a, and then, then his, his father dies when he's 10 and uh, they go from kind of, you know, cause he's, he's really descended from the sort of German Jewish intelligentsia and, and grew up, you know, in a, a, a certain standard of living, but when after his father died, they were really became desperately poor. Uh, his mother was kind of you know broken by it, and and his uh, he had a side effect from some kind of inoculation when he was a kid that caused all of his hair to fall out, and you know it, so it was a very uh, pretty much as bad as a childhood can get, and he really had to you know, invent himself um, in, in various ways. And, you know, it, it was um, as a student at the University of Chicago, where back then you didn't even, you know, you could, you didn't even have to graduate high school, you just could take a test. And if you scored high enough, you could just go. It was just a, a, a very precocious kind of environment. And he met Elaine May there, even though she wasn't fully enrolled. Um, but yeah, they, as you said, like, he first became famous, you know, very famous in America as a comedian, as part of this duo. And then at some point, Elaine May just decided she didn't want to do it anymore. And he was just bereft, had no idea what he was going to do with his life. He was in his early 30s. And um, his agent, you know, sent him a, uh, a play by Neil Simon, who was not then a big deal. And that's that the rest is history pretty much you know because i mean that the successes from those early plays are what kind of wound up launching his film career of course that doesn't happen for with every theater director so it does it's a testament to his the real breadth and range of his talents and you know um, yeah. his capacity to continue reinventing i mean and, and it, it, even though he was famous basically for 50 you know plus years he did, he did not everything was a success and he did have to kind of keep picking himself up and dusting himself off and reinventing himself creatively to kind of come back again and again, which he did. But the, uh, the artistic separation from Elaine May, because they were wildly successful, you know, quickly and early uh, when they left Chicago. And uh, that, that left him kind of in the wilderness for a while and sort of, bereft um i forgot who it was who told us that that when elaine kind of pulled the plug on it on on their on their on their partnership they would work again later i mean with elaine as a screenwriter um and screen doctor on some of mike's films but he was uh, quite bereft and at sea before as ash explains that you know um he directing found him or he found directing as a as a kind of uh a vocation you know and and from what i understand um he also felt when he began directing that this was it this was what he was meant to do in a sense that he knew what to do 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of us children of doctors always assume we're going to be doctors, uh, but we don't feel it. And we don't necessarily want to, to you know, continue on that path. But at some point, there's something that we know we don't just do well, but are excited by and have a feeling for. And this seems to have happened to him. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Go on, Ash. Well, I, I was just going to say that so, um, a few a few of the theater directors and actors we've talked to talk about how good director is kind of a, you know, a little bit of a father figure. Uh, I mean, you know, or mother, depending on the gender of the, of the director. But that, that, that there's sort of a dream father. And um, uh, I think that because, you know, Mike's losing his father early in life. Like, I think that, that there's, there's a connection there to why he embraced this particular role and why he ultimately did prefer it to being a performer. Um, it, it, it serves, you know, not just a, uh, it was not just a creative fulfillment, but I think a psychological one as well. Yeah, um, I, I will just jump in and tell you a, a quick thing that happened to me. Um, that I never realized, except for the comedy, uh, what a performer Mike Nichols was. Um, but about 20 years ago, uh, there was a, a, a play by Wallace Shawn, the designated mourner. There was a movie version of it that mm -hmm. we showed at the museum. And uh, of the, uh, I don't know, it feels like 50, maybe 20 people showed up. Of, of the 20, I think only three um, found any value in it. And I, I think it ought to be re-released because it's about a, uh, a group of modern folks who have rationalized living in an authoritarian regime. And they, they try and integrate their sophisticated dinner parties and so on into, into living in, in a place that they never imagined they would. But Nichols, uh, who plays the lead in, in the movie version, it's kind of a table read. He blew my mind. He was so good. He was such a mesmerizing performer um, that it was a complete revelation to me. I had no idea. What what kind of acting did he do during his prime years and, and did he continue doing it ever? Oh, sorry about that. Um, he and Elaine, I'm oh, sorry, go on. No, no, I apologize for that. Oh, no, uh, I was going to say, you know, he, he and Elaine uh, yeah, okay. at, at the Long Wharf um, in Connecticut, they played George and Martha in oh, uh, yeah, Afraid yeah, of Virginia. I mean, we, we did a whole chapter on Designated Mourner because we thought it was, we were likewise totally blown away by his performance in it. It's, uh, the film version is, at least last I checked on YouTube, if anyone is interested to check it out. Um, but he, they, the, he, he and Elaine also, they did a, uh, they played George and Martha in a, in a revival of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in 1980 in New Haven. Um, and so we, we spoke to uh, James Naughton and Swoozy Kurtz who played the young couple in that production. It was, I mean, other than those two and occasionally, you know, they would do, he and Elaine would, you know, do a routine for a charity or something like that. But that, that was really pretty much it after, um, after his kind of, you know, student days and, and his days as a, you know, half of Nichols and May were over, which is partly, and so he was really sticking his neck out in doing both of those things. And, uh, and it's in fact why he, he only wanted to do designated mourner in London and refused to promote the movie in America when it came out. I think, um, he, he, you know, r r I mean, wrongly in my view, but uh, felt more secure as a director than than as a, an actor. But I mean, you know, Meryl Streep and Christopher Walken told us they were just completely blown away by that performance as well. Oh, I was going to, uh, may I read Meryl Streep's uh, comment about it? I think it's really telling and well oh, said. Sam. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, this is Meryl Streep. There is a piece of film of him performing in the designated mourner, Wally Shawn's terrific play. Mike suppressed it for years, went to great lengths to keep it out of circulation here in the United States. 
I don't know why. Maybe because he just didn't like to look at himself. A lot of actors share this reluctance. It was so naked, absolutely riveting and upsetting and funny and well, just like life. Mike in that just blew me away. It's some of the best acting I've ever seen any man do. Just high praise coming from Meryl Streep, I think. And he barely moves, but it's so lived in and naked and canny. It really made me understand something about him. Well, I never knew I had anything in common with Meryl Streep before, but it it was really astounding to me, and I've never understood why it hasn't received more. I'm glad uh, you mentioned um, it. Uh, it, it was, yeah, it was great. A, the nice thing about running your own theater is yeah. that you can play stuff that you like. If people yeah. come, that's great. If they don't, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a, it was an extraordinary work, and the and the play was great too. But but talking about the film career um, after after the graduate, can you talk a little about the Catch Twenty Two, um, and I mean literally about Catch Twenty Two, not what life does to us, <laughs> what that experience was like for him uh, and the people who worked with him on that film, because there was an enormous amount of great talent that uh, had something to do with Catch Twenty Two, and yet. As, as they say. Well, it's, I mean, yeah. certainly uh, there, I mean, just for him to, to get the rights to what was one of the hottest novels of the decade, critically, um, was a very big coup. A lot of people wanted to direct it, including, including Orson Welles, who, uh, you know, Nichols gave a role to, which also added, which is not the best um, on-set relationship. But yeah, it was, I mean, you know, the cast is incredible. Buck Henry, uh, wrote the, uh, adapted the script, um, again, you know, so it's the graduate team back together again. He worked with, he had Fellini cinematographer. I mean, it really was a pretty uh, amazing group of people. Now, the, there are different uh, explanations. I mean, MASH came out around the same time, a little bit before, and a lot of people involved with the movie felt like it kind of, um, that the, that Catch Twenty, you know, it just seemed hipper and fresher than Catch Twenty Two, and and kind of, um, you know, took the wind out of the out of the movie sales a little bit. A couple of all, people also told us that there was a little bit of it. People were, you know, Mike had had such early success as a comedian, and then as a theater director, and then with his first two films, you know, um, it was just so. so almost unprecedented. You would have to go back to the young Orson Welles for that kind of a string of, of early success. That there was a little bit, uh, people were, you know, kind of hoping he, waiting for him to fail, hoping he was going to fail. There was a, a little undercurrent of resentment building. So that may have contributed as well. Now, having said all that, I personally think it's an incredible movie. So, and, and one that, that is due for um, a reappraisal now that, you know, yeah. all decades have passed me, there's no reason to be comparing it with MASH anymore. Um, in, in a way, you know, MASH actually feels more dated to me personally, but. Yeah, the, um, uh, it, mm -hmm. it's amazing, of course, in show business, how quickly people turn on you. Um, it, suddenly it was, it was attacked yeah. with a ferocity that almost seemed like, well, we've been waiting for this to happen. Um, what what kind of impact did that have on him? Uh, that 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 was was the critical response to things uh, really important to him, and was that a particularly disturbing experience in any way? Sam, well, well, I, yeah, I think I think it, I think it, I think it was. You know, <laughs> this man had had, you know, fabulous success. I mean, you know, his first play, he wins the Tony, the, you know, Barefoot in the Park, and he does love. He, you know, he, he wins the Tony. The Odd Couple, he wins the Tony. He, he his first film, you know, um, Virginia Woolf, it gets, uh, what, five? Got a lot of Oscar nominations, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and brought people in to see Edward Albee play. Um, it, it was quite an astounding experience seeing that with a with an audience for the first time. Yeah, in terms of what you're asking, it's sort of a yes and no. I mean, 
um, uh, so, uh, so, so, some people told us that you know he he was just Maybe. completely crushed mm -hmm. by the, uh, the the kind of critical panning. Um, but then his his longtime friend, um, uh, uh, production designer Tony Walton, told us that you know after it all kind of blew over. He and Mike spoke on the phone, and Mike said, "You know, this is what I've been fearing, like, and it's happened, and kind of, you know, I'm still here, like, like life goes on, and and I think that that experience um, was an important kind of test that he passed, and because it it would happen several times later in his career, um, and you know, the, that the rest of the the next few movies, you know, the reception was very mixed, even though I think there are some." Um, I mean, I think Carnal Knowledge is certainly a masterpiece, you know, our, one of his very best movies. Um, but yeah, it, it, he he never really enjoyed that same kind of unbroken success again. He had to kind of continue fighting for it um, as, as time went on. But, you know, the fact that he did continue to do so, like, well past when a lot of his contemporaries, you know, were kind of uh, had stopped working um and i mean a, you know angels in america is really the last great example of this in his career i mean it's hard to remember now because we've been in this sort of age of golden age of tell our third golden age of television for so long but when he took that um when he decided to direct that you know people of his level in hollywood just were not doing television not even hbo i mean and so that's certainly true of of the uh, the cast because I mean you know you have, I, just before this you'd have Steven Spielberg with Band of Brothers and but the you know Meryl Streep Al Pacino like these people were not doing television it was really Mike who kind of got them on board and got them to do it um, so you know here's a, a man like you know uh, many decades into his career deciding to take it. I mean, he actually had, we don't even get into this in the book. He, he had one experience with television previously and the show got canceled after like five episodes. I mean, it was a complete and utter disaster, but for him to try it again. Um, and, you know, to, with such a challenging piece of material, um, just shows that he, he was just always taking risks. Um, even as, you know, not, not that he, didn't also try to, he wanted to succeed commercially as well, but he had basically kind of just come off this this um, movie he did with Gary Shandling that was a very negative experience for all, especially Gary Shandling, I think, because Mike really regretted taking the job and kind of treated him shabbily. But um, a friend of his told him, you know, you're, you're getting kind of farther and farther from what it is that Drew got you interested in doing this in the first place, and which is the art. And so that was, uh, and, he, and he said you need to be at HBO, and that was what led to Wit, and then to Angels subsequently. So, um, yeah, he he you know he wasn't the he he was able to kind of reinvent himself, come back you know many times over a very long career. Well, you know, there was a, there was a reason why he uh, he called his production company Icarus Productions. You know, I mean, it, you know, it, uh, as, as his, his brother said, you know, he he sailed so close to the sun, you know, so early on, you know. That, anyway, yep, taking risks can uh, can result in all kinds of disasters and masterpieces. The the, yeah. I, I want to ask you guys before we um, get any farther with specific works, um, mm. your own work, the, the title of the book, Mike Nichols is remembered by 150 of his closest friends, uh, is all by itself kind of an astounding thing to think about. I don't think I've ever had 150 <laughs> close friends. I'm sure there are good reasons for that. But nevertheless, um, did you have trouble ever in getting people to talk about Mike Nichols because the overriding uh, well, I, feeling I that you get from reading these folks is that everybody found him to be in some way or, or other almost 
uh, spectacular in in some way. Sam, you were about to say. Yeah, Sam. Yeah, well, I want to say that the, the idea of, of you know, recall, remembered by 150 of his closest friends, that's the title, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, that really kind of belongs to, to Ash. It's kind of, a, kind of an ingenious title, because in a way it's also meant somewhat ironically in the sense that that, that was one of his other gifts, <coughs> was his gift for, for friendship and his gift for making you feel like you were a close friend. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I certainly wasn't, you know, but yet he, you know, he'd remember a birthday or he was, you know, I mean, uh, he, he, he did want to discuss with you something he'd read, you know, if you had sent him a book or an article or something. So there were a lot of people who thought, gosh, I really am, um, you know, in fact, Simon Callow, who reviewed our, our book in the um, New York Review of Books, said he had kind of that same experience, you know, where um, you know, he, he felt, made him feel as if he was kind of an intimate of his when, when Callow says, certainly I wasn't, you know. So it was this, <clears throat> this idea that, that there were hundreds of people who thought that, you know, they were close friends of, of mine. And he did have a lot of close friends. And, and right. you know, let's see it. but but um, it, it was a wonderful title in a way because it's it also sh shows that he he did have this, this gift and how he was re regarded. Um, uh, we we didn't get too many people that I can re remember now. It's years ago already, practically, um, who sort of turned us down. Although, to be to be to be honest, you know, Elaine May, who doesn't talk to anyone except her dear man, you know, and uh, possibly her, her daughter, um, you know, didn't want to talk to us. Um, and uh, and also remember, Mike was was not long out of this world when we started to, to do this work, really. I mean, it was kind of a, it was a fresh wound for a lot of people. And um, uh, so she didn't. And obviously, uh, Diane Sawyer, who, who, um, you know, gave a kind of mute blessing to our work, but wasn't going to be a part of it. Yeah, well, that's just a did, decision. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, we did have to, with those two exceptions, we had to kind of cut it off at, we were adding people right up until we, the, 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 our editor kind of snatched the digital manuscripts from our hands, basically. And I mean, you know, for one thing, this, this form, uh, which we certainly, you know, there have been other, uh, we, we didn't invent it, but there are certain requirements for, you know, uh, not every, it doesn't work for every subject equally well. And the reason it works well for say Truman Capote is the same, like, you know, like Mike, he just cut an incredible swath through society and the arts. And, he, you know, he was very social and knew a lot of people that, that you could talk to. So that was, which, you know, Mike had that, um, but there, I mean, another part of the archness of the, the title, it has to do with this idea that he, it's like what, what Maureen Dowd said, that, that he was a null coward figure with a Jerzy Kaczynski past. Mm -hmm. And he, he has this, it, you know, this persona. And so the, that, that's a big theme of the book is about kind of, you know, Mike Nichols, the persona, and Mike Nichols, the the, the man constructing that persona. Right. And, and somebody in the book describes him as having um, no face, that, that you can't remember uh, what what he looks like. Um, and, mm. and yet, when you're in his presence, um, you, you're certainly aware of it. I, I sat next to um, Mike Nichols at dinner one night at an extremely crowded restaurant. This must have been maybe around 1980, something like that, 85. Um, it's a place on 7th Avenue, the Trattoria del Art, which was really packed and really loud. One of those places where you have to shout to hear the, the person you're sitting next to. So he was sitting with somebody else who I didn't recognize right, right next to me. And they were talking animatedly. And the person he was with never said, what, I can't hear you. They were chatting 
not in a particularly loud tone of voice, but clearly were, were communicating. And the person I was with, I paid no attention to because all I wanted to do was hear what Mike Nichols was saying <laughs> at the next table. And I couldn't hear a word of it, not one word, but there was something about his, his yeah. smiling, talking and animated quality that I knew he was telling stories and that I wanted to hear those stories. And I, I get the feeling reading through a, a lot of the comments uh, and, and a lot of the interviews in your book that he was a great storyteller in, in every sense and that people gravitate toward that, uh, both as people yeah. who pay money to see a movie or a play and people who who are sitting across the table from someone who tells a, a great uh, anecdote. Well, you know, he, he, he sort of directed that way too. He directed by kind of parable, you know, telling, you know, I mean, you know, he wouldn't, it wouldn't just be a piece of business or what's your motivation. It would be, did I ever tell you about the time I accidentally, you know, was in the washroom next to uh, Milton Berle, or, you know what I mean? It's, um, uh, you know, it, it, there was, uh, well, we'll stop that anecdote there, I think, but, Oh, no, that's okay. I've got I've got one about William Holden, but but no, no, um, this is this in the <laughs> afternoon. And there are children watching, you know. But, oh, okay, but, that's right. But but he did he did, he, but Meryl Streep. Other people have said that this is this was his his way, you know, of um, it was kind of circuitous, and and I I don't know if it was um, Kurt. Kurt Russell, somebody said, you know, I didn't always get what he was driving at, but it was, you know, it was kind of his, 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 his way of trying to get to the nub of, 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 of what was really going on in a script or in a piece of business. And, and uh, he was a great storyteller. Yeah. And it was a, it was a technique he kind of um, stole from, uh, um, sorry, it's been, it's been a long day. Uh, and I'm on, here to make it longer. <laughs> on, on the waterfront, uh, the director uh, Kazan. Kazan, sorry, I, yeah. I do know who he is. Okay, Leah Kazan. <laughs> yeah, just, I got a one-year-old, so sorry. Um, it, it was a technique he he got from Kazan, and and not only, you know, for actors who were hip to it, who could see what he was getting at with these stories and about how they related to material, it was, you know. Uh, it, they just uh, many. I mean, just countless actors told us how kind of you know unique and and um, just that it produced different results from other directors they work with. But it was a lot of the stories he told were about himself and about kind of things that didn't always you know make him look great. And it was a way of you know by revealing something of himself, he wanted to encourage a kind of reciprocal intimacy with the actors, and and that right. is another. Thing. He he really would get these, you know. He they would he would build in these long rehearsal periods for Hollywood movies, which is totally unheard of from most of the actors that we talked to. And he did that, which he obviously got from the theater, but so that they could really bond as a as a little company and kind of begin, you know, kind of creatively conspiring together. And, I mean, like Christopher Walken said that you know he's been on thing. You know, there, he'll watch the finished movie and there'll be, you know, people, co-stars he's never even met. But while he was um, working with Mike, like on, you know, the stage and film that it was completely the opposite where he would, you know, they would be like living together in kind of, you know, a dormitory style situation if they were doing something out of town or whatever it was, these really strong bonds would form. And I think that in Mike's best work, you know, that uh, a big part of that has to do with that strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would think also that, that in relating parables um, to people when you're, when you're directing a scene, uh, particularly if they're of a personal nature, that it, that it makes the person, I don't care how famous you are. Um, if, if you're with someone you respect, say a Mike Nichols, being let in on a, a piece of someone's life like that, would make you feel, for lack of a better word, special mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. respected. And yeah. that has to go a long way toward creating not just friendships, but uh, uh, wanting to, to please uh, a, a creator 
who has true. chosen you to be a part yeah. of a vision. One, one, one thing that when I was uh, you know sitting in the back of one of those acting classes that he taught that has always stuck with me is he said that all drama is a, a long-winded way of asking the audience, has this ever happened to you? And, and you know, so even though like a lot of his films, there's a kind of, uh, you know, formal daring or what have you, that's something that he never lost sight of is, is that that's the point of the, the whole exercise. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, some directors can just get so carried away by the technique that they, they do lose sight of that. And, you know, even if, you know, and I, I think that that was just a real uh, thread through Mike's whole career. Yeah, I feel like I saw myself on the screen at some point. Um, is what an audience is going to respond to, and I'd assume as far back as the graduate, mm -hmm. that's what a generation responded to, not just my parents don't understand me, but this is the way I, I feel, and this is the way I respond, and maybe I'm, I'm, you know, not the most physically, uh, you know, beautiful Adonis of all time, and maybe I just make noises at a certain point, and maybe I just react in a certain way. But as formally, you, you know, you're absolutely right. As formally superb as the movie is, it's that aspect of it that has yeah. made it. Or yeah. if you're a bit older, maybe you're identifying with Mr. or Mrs. Robinson, or you know, you did different characters in the, the. Mrs. Robinson's turned into a very sympathetic character yeah. over the years, as I've watched that movie over and over again. She was she was pathetic at mm -hmm. first. Uh, that's easy, but she's that's much a, more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, Anne Bancroft know, does it with very little screen time, in a sense. I mean, she's, she's a brilliant actor. Very. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, I was well, next to I was next to Anne Bancroft at dinner one night too. It was a lot of people at the Russian Tea Room, and Mel Brooks was there. And I remember the person who was making everyone laugh was Anne Bancroft. She was she was hilarious, <laughs> um, and just a, a, a sort of a, a force of nature. So I would imagine deciding who you're going to use in a part casting huge part of all of it you see the stage at dinner to her that's unusual i mean um but you know uh there is something that closes out our book um that speaks to what elliot was talking about about mike as an actor and then later as a director and then finally about his whole persona and life which is very short and indulge me i'll, I'll read it to you all. It, it's, uh, it ends our book, actually. Um, I don't think you can make a general rule that every director should study acting, but I do know that he understood the process more than any other director I've ever worked with, without question. That's why he trusted that if he saw the spark of something in you, he knew he just had to entertain it out of you. But I think that more profoundly, he himself was acting all the time, right from the beginning. He was acting being an American. He was acting being a blonde. He was acting being confident. He was acting being the smartest person in the room. That is actually a definition of acting. You have all these things that you want desperately to be real and you live in them and they become you. Whatever the process is, I really don't understand, but I know that he understood it. That's that, that, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And, uh, yeah. Good yeah. summation and probably a good way for me to wrap this up. I know I have to do that. Um, yeah. It's been a great pleasure talking to both of you. I wish we could have talked longer. You probably don't, but nevertheless, I do. It's nice to nice to get to know you a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the the thank book, you. the book, which is the big thing here, you've got to read it, everybody. It's, it's Ash Carter and Sam Kashner's book. It's called Life Isn't Everything. Uh, Mike Nichols is remembered by 150 of his closest friends. It's a great read and it's it's like being there. Maybe even better because you can wear anything you want. <laughs> anyway, thanks, thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Our, our thanks to you, Ash and Sam and Elliot for being with us and for such an interesting discussion. I was fascinated. Um, we want to thank you all at home for joining us and stick around a little bit longer. The next event is Red Sea Spies by Rafi Berg at 245.
Remember, if you want to, to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or visit our website at culturaljccdet.org slash book fair. The rest of our schedule and ways to get involved are there. Have a great day.